What is the Mediterranean diet? In the 1960s, Ansel Keys, he found that most people in working class areas of Greece had lower risk for heart disease. What's different is all the spices and herbs that make it exciting and different and vocal to those particular countries and cultures. And I'm hoping that today I can provide, you know, just a few ways, um, tips and tricks to help you make every day more meditative terrain. Welcome to the Performance Initiative Podcast. Our goal is to provide you and ourselves with the tools to be the best versions of ourselves. We are your hosts, Dr. Grant Cooper and Dr. Zenovi Mailer. We just wrapped up a conversation with Serena Ball. And in this conversation, she answers questions like, what is Mediterranean diet? You'd think you'd know, but do you? Well, we'll see. And she also goes into questions like, how do you make a nutritious and healthy and tasty breakfast? How do you prep for lunch? How do you uh, prep for dessert that is both tasty, good, and along the Mediterranean diet guidelines? And along the lines of, of this conversation, it is peppered with, with tremendous takeaways. Like, uh, did you know that selenium-rich fish will counter, uh, counteract the mercury that's in that fish? Did you know that you can, use, um, you can use rice vinegar instead of salt? A lot of those takeaways I didn't know, and it was really interesting. And there's no one better to be talking about this to than Serena Ball. Serena uh, you've, you've no doubt run across her writings in different nutrition magazines, uh, websites. She's been on a regular on television, morning shows, news shows. She is a wealth of information. What she is really best known for probably is along with her co-author, Diana Seagrave, Seagrave Daly, uh, they are the authors of best-selling Mediterranean diet books. Um, and they have one after another. And there's, there's a lot in it for the uh, seasoned gourmet. And also for the, for the folks that, that, that don't know their way quite as well around the kitchen. So there's a lot of practical takeaways for everyone. She was wonderful. We really think you're going to enjoy this one. Uh, one one uh, quick call to action. Uh, friends, if you haven't uh, subscribed to the channel yet, we, we would sure help us out a lot if you'd consider doing that. Uh, don't forget, if you can, to throw a like onto the uh, episode. And please consider sharing this also with your friends and community. Thank you so much. Enjoy this episode. Serena, thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. Um, when we speak to experts in healthcare medicine, and when the question of the diet comes up, inevitably, almost always, the answer is Mediterranean diet in one shape or another. Um, once we start talking about this, however, and delving into it, it doesn't seem like we clearly understand what that is. Yeah, so we were, we were at a, a dinner. It was me, Zenobi, and a few other people, some doctors, some not. And we mentioned that you were coming on the show and everyone was excited and they all had different questions they wanted to raise about the Mediterranean diet. And as we started talking about that, we realized we all had different ideas about what that was. It was like, it was, it was like asking someone, how does a bicycle work? And everyone nods and said, oh, I know how a bicycle works. And you say, describe it. And it's like, well, there's gears and there's pedals. And with the Mediterranean diet, I said fruits and vegetables and fish. And someone else said, and lamb. And another person said, no meat. And we realized yeah, we all have different ideas of what a Mediterranean diet is. You're the expert. So what is a Mediterranean diet? Thanks for having me, guys. I really appreciate being on today. Um, it is a really exciting time, kind of at the beginning of the year, to kind of get back on track and get to the basics and figure out what the Mediterranean diet is. And I'm hoping that today I can provide, you know, just a few ways, um, tips and tricks to help you make every day more Mediterranean. So adding a few things here, not too many subtractions, but lots of just adding little bits of um, different ways that you eat in the kitchen and that you sit down with your friends and family at the table um, that can help you your, all of your meals more be more Mediterranean. So what is the Mediterranean diet? Well, first of all, it's fun to remember where the Mediterranean Sea itself is. So it is surrounded by around 20 countries, and that's everything from Greece and southern France to Morocco and Turkey and uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina and Croatia, and it's a giant area. So thinking about all those different countries, what, you know, it began as um, 
in the 1960s, Ansel Keys, he found that most people in working class areas of Greece had lower risk for heart disease. But what it's really evolved to mean is the way that people eat surrounding the Mediterranean diet, and then most of those ingredients that they use in their food are the same. What's different is all the spices and herbs that make it exciting and different and local to those particular countries and cultures. So let's start listing food. Okay, I would list at the top beans, lots of beans and lentils whole grains, of course, fruits and vegetables, herbs, lots and lots of fresh herbs. And that's one of the things I'm going to be talking about later, but just, just different ways to pick up a package of herbs at the grocery store and use them until they're gone because they have so many antioxidants and they're bright green and they can help add freshness to our winter diet right now, especially if you're eating, eating seasonally. And then of course, fish. And olive oil, lots of olive oil. That is the main fat. And yen, yes, some fermented dairy foods. And that fermented food is an important part for gut health and for other um, decreasing other uh, chronic disease risk factors and for brain health. And then also um, some meat, for sure. Uh, that is part of it, especially in the wintertime for B vitamins and zinc. And as my next cookbook that's coming out in May is about brain health, those vitamins and nutrients that we get from um, animal proteins and especially meat are especially important for brain health. Not necessarily every day, but a couple times a week. And they also, we say as dietitians, they're a great way, meat is a great way to help us eat more vegetables too. So if you need to flavor your, your vegetables with meat, Go for it because that's an um, important part of the Mediterranean diet and the way that um, people in all cultures have flavored food, have flavored their vegetables and their food um, throughout the centuries, really. And then that's basically the the short list. We can get into some some different um, details, but I would also add lots of citrus. And I'm actually wearing my lemon shirt today, and not to forget lots of flavoring with lemon and citrus. And the amount of acid and flavor that citrus adds to um, the Mediterranean diet as well. Yeah, uh, no, so, so it seems like it includes a lot of a lot of variety and a lot of different things. Is it reasonable to ask this question? Um, and maybe there is no clear answer to that. Is there something that is to, to look at it conversely? Is there something that is not Mediterranean diet? Is there something that shouldn't be included when we think of it as a Mediterranean diet? I would say that. In one way, it's more of a lifestyle that it's not. It's not mm. a lifestyle that's sit down, not even not even sitting down, but standing at the kitchen cutter and scarfing down your food. Or yes, you can have um, meals together as a family in the car, but it <laughs> makes takes a little bit more attention. And I do have five children. And so we're driving around a lot and we do have to be a little bit more intentional when we have our meals in the car. But in general, I would say it's sitting down at the table and eating with family and friends and enjoying that conviviality or that time together and really just taking a deep breath before you eat and start, um, like I said, scarfing down right. your so I That's really a great take point. some intentionality yeah. in terms of the lifestyle of eating together. And that really is an important part of it. Um, we do, may have brushed over that a little bit more, but the research, especially since the pandemic, has become more um, focused on that benefit of the Mediterranean diet, which is eating together with family and friends, or even if it's just sitting down with someone else at a restaurant that you might be next to at some of the restaurants, of course, they have um, communal dining. If you're eating in the park, if you're eating, if you're eating over Zoom with a friend, if you can have that connection with people um, in terms of brain health, especially, which is part of the Mediterranean diet, that show that um, research is coming out showing us that that's a main benefit in the Mediterranean diet is eating together and that lifestyle of slowing down and 
taking a couple of deep breaths before yeah. you. There is there is a uh, a really cute uh, study that I was just reading about that illustrates this nicely, where they asked uh, people in France, "How do you know when dinner is over?" And they said, "Well, the food, you know, you start to get full. The food starts to change taste. You don't appreciate it as much." And they asked the same question of Americans, and they said, "The television show is over." <laughs> and it, you know, it, it's and, and I, I think that's been a really underappreciated aspect of this this diet, this way of this way of orienting to food, really. And this this does really go beyond just the Mediterranean region, right? Because the blue zones that have been studied over the years uh, go far beyond that, and there are certain commonalities. Um, some things like fermented food that we're going to touch on, I'm sure, uh, but also the social aspect for sure. Things like uh, uh, community and uh, and eating together and preparing the meal together, even as part of the process. And places like Okinawa and, and other yes. places around the world, with where the longevity exceeds far beyond the life expectancy in the yeah. world. Yeah, right, there's can we more of a focus on the meal itself, just not what even like down to the nutrients that are in food, but more of a focus on the culture of eating together and just taking time with with your food. Yeah. Can we jump into the actual meat? Yes. The actual meat of the matter. As, as you, you know, the, the, the first question that my wife asked me to ask you um, is what oils do you recommend people cook with? And how do you feel about avocado oil in particular? Okay, so I have one olive oil right here, which... If if this particular this is fresh fresh pressed farms, which is actually one of the only it's the only olive oil that I know of that's produced in the U.S. It's grown in in Georgia, mm. and they produce an olive oil in Georgia. Um, but in general, that oh, just would be the one that I picked up today, and they actually sent me that. But in general, I use olive oil all the time. That's pretty much the only olive the only oil that I have in my Covered. I use it for cooking, for eating, for sauteing, um, for making salad dressings. Um, avocado oil is fine. I mean, honestly, what Deanna and I have written our cookbooks um, for is maybe more of a general population. And I mean, our first book, um, which I will actually hold it up, um, the 30-Minute Mediterranean Diet Cookbook, I mean, it's sold over a quarter of a million copies. Uh, people love it. It's quick and easy. I'm not going to recommend avocado oil because it's just not something that everybody has in their pantry all the time. Yeah. It's fine. But I would say grab a bottle of olive oil, keep it in your pantry, use it for... People don't really understand that you can use olive oil for saute. You can use it for roasting. It does have a high smoke point. Um some of the nutrients, the actual antioxidants that can be found in the oil may be degraded at that higher temperature, but heat degrades antioxidants for your food too. So just making sure that you eat the olive oil with other fruits and vegetables and um, whole grains and so on, so that at some point you get some of the antioxidants from the olive oil, but then you're also getting it if you eat olives also. So um, I, I don't worry too much about um, the oil besides just keeping a bottle of olive oil in my, in my pantry. If, if, you're, if you're making, uh, speaking for myself as a, as a cooking extreme novice, uh, if you were making scrambled eggs for your son, who's very picky about foods, uh, would, you, would you use olive oil for that or would you use something else? I would use olive oil. You yeah. would? Okay. All right. Just, just... Yeah. And I might even drizzle some on top if he used picky i would drizzle some some olive oil on top because it adds some yummy flavor i would also mix in some um whole fat greek yogurt um that's the way my that's what my daughter actually eats she's two and she eats scrambled eggs with yogurt every day for lunch nice all right lutra get ready (laughs) (laughs) yeah um Something that we were, yeah, we, we, we were talking about before about how, how you would get, use me, the Mediterranean diet depending on what kinds of activities you were building up for. So if you were trying to build muscle for a sport, let's say. Yeah. So when, you, when you're trying to go into something that's, let's say, what we we're trying to get to is uh, different focuses, right? So let's say someone who is trying to get a little bit more protein in their diet, but yet still maintain that nice balance and not just go all carnivore. 
what's a good way to utilize Mediterranean diet for that purpose? That's a great question, actually. Um, so there was a re there was a study that came out. I think it's only been about a year ago, um, and I don't have it on the top of my head. I'll share it with you guys later if you have show notes. Um, but it basically looked at um, can the Mediterranean diet be a lower carb diet? Um, in terms, of, I mean, it has been shown to help reduce the risk of uh, type two diabetes overall. And so that's usually most people think that that's probably because it has a higher level of fat in it. And so it helps maintain blood sugar um, at a more stable level for longer amounts of time. But there was a study that looked at, and I believe the reason why the, the authors started it was because um, they wanted a lower carb diet for people who already have type 2 diabetes. And it was found that it can still you can still have a, a purely Mediterranean diet at a lower carb level. And that's really just being smart about your carbs. I mean, it still includes pasta, but when you're making pasta, this is one, this is one of my tricks on how to incorporate Mediterranean um, every day. I'm not saying eat pasta every day, but I am saying when you do eat pasta, make sure you cook it till just al dente. Because what research has shown is when Pasta is cooked to just al dente, which means if you read that that um, directions on the box, cook it for the lower amount of time, and then it still has a tiny bit of chew to the pasta, and it is a low glycemic um, food. So that means that basically, if you overcook your pasta, it fills with water, makes it waterlogged, makes it take a, a shorter amount of time to digest. And so it doesn't keep you fuller for longer. If you cook it till just al dente, it's not so waterlogged. It takes your body longer for it to break down. And it is a um, lower glycemic food and keeps the energy steady for a longer amount of time. So, sorry, one second. Not... Just, sorry, just to interject one, one yeah. quick question about that. Uh, what do you make of, um, of some claims that uh, slower processed pasta? is better and the way it is processed in the Mediterranean is over a longer period of time. And one heuristic, one way to, to notice that is the color of the pasta when you buy it, yellow versus lighter. Do you, do you think there's any- That is true. That is true. But I wouldn't recommend that everybody go out and look at the color of their pasta. Because once again, at, at the level of where people are shopping at the grocery store, they're not going to sit there and compare the pasta colors. Uh -huh. They're just going to grab a package of pasta. What if one and had a choice? But I, a but you're right. It, it takes longer and they use a dye, a type of um, casting method that makes the pasta itself more like um, uh, variegated. So it's not super smooth, but you're right. And that stuff, that like good stuff, like authentic and, and imported is really good for um, capturing the sauce and keeping it in the pasta and making it more flavorful. But at the level of just supermarket pasta, you know, when we're talking about, um, you know, for the masses, just tell people to don't overcook your pasta. That's probably the easiest message, but you're, uh, you're absolutely right. And it does, that stuff imported it does taste really, really good. But again, if you have a flavorful sauce with lots of spices and maybe more a Moroccan spice profile with Ras it's like you're not going to be able to taste the different pasta. Use that expensive stuff if you're just eating olive oil and crushed red pepper and some garlic, like good stuff. That's that's really true. But back to yes. more, more protein and less carbs. Um, I would say that most of your carbs then should probably come from lentils and beans because they are a higher carb food. But they really are an important part of the Mediterranean diet and should be eaten around three to four times a week. And so, but they also have a higher amount of protein than maybe a bowl of pasta. Um, it depends on the bean and of course what you're eating with it. Also, again, making sure that especially if you're an athlete that you have some meat in there two to three times a week and then seafood at least twice a week because seafood for anti-inflammation and um, because the seafood includes selenium which is one of the strongest antioxidants that there is 
And people don't realize that also selenium helps mitigate any of the risk of mercury. So some people say, oh, we can't eat fish because some fish, especially tuna, has mercury in it. Don't worry about that at all. The only mercury containing fish that you really need to worry about are those five that Americans never eat, like tilefish and shark and the ones that we just don't even have to worry about. Anything else has such a high amount of selenium in it that it really mitigates any of the risks that might come from mercury. So I How just does that work? I just, I've never heard that before. So you're saying so if, if there's a high selenium content, does it somehow displace the mercury or how does that it basically is a higher amount of the antioxidant and yes it 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 just mitigates any of that that um, mercury risk so again and then also most of the the seafood that's in the grocery store now are low mercury fishes anyway so yeah. it's just kind of something that's unfortunately been overblown even when i was pregnant i didn't even worry about mercury i just made sure that and again if you were eating these fishes every single day it might be a problem but most americans don't eat any more than fish two to maybe three times a week so you just don't have to worry about it do you ever recommend people take selenium supplements then i'm a food first kind of a girl no, i just i just um, curious. i, just, I, I, I never yeah. heard the uh, if people ate two to three servings of fish a week, they would be fine. Yeah. Um, if you're going to take a supplement, I'd look for a good fish oil. Um, mm -hmm. I wouldn't necessarily recommend that selenium. Yeah. And for the and fish, the I think what you're saying is that there's been an overcorrection also into people being so scared of the mercury that they stay away from this very important food source. And if you just go back to two or three, which I think is probably close to what people recommend in yeah. general, and just stay away from the really big predator fish like shark and tilefish and yes, swordfish and stuff, which nobody you knows. You know where to get tilefish? I don't, I don't know where to get shark. I mean, seriously, especially here in the Midwest, like there's no way we're going to find any tilefish <laughs> in the grocery store. No way. So just eat that can too. I actually have a couple of uh, my favorites here that I buy. I mean, who's eating sardines these days? I mean, sardines are so so good for you and they come in a little can and all you have to do is open the can and smush it up and add some mayonnaise or some olive oil and you've got yeah. a sardine sandwich like no one does that that's the biggest concern but then we have all these little packets of, of tuna and salmon and those are so easy to rip open those absolutely count as servings of seafood throughout the eat and then just regular cans of tuna absolutely counts yeah. As I mean, a tuna melt with a piece of whole grain bread and tuna fish mixed with a little olive oil and even a little bit of cheese on top. That absolutely counts as a serving. Penny, hungry. I knew I should have eaten <laughs> before we talked. <laughs> Friends, we hope you're finding value in the content. If you're enjoying what you're watching, please consider hitting the like button. Help us with our YouTube algorithm. Consider subscribing to the channel and turn on the notification button to stay up to date with everything going on in the channel. You know, I just, before we move on, I, I wanted to ask you a question about the beans in particular. For people yeah. who, uh, you know, when they hear beans, they, they think, oh, no, 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 that's going to upset my stomach and give me all kinds of gas. Is it the case that if you, if you stay eating beans for a while, your, your, your microbiome will essentially get better at processing it and the yeah, side effects will go away? Extreme. You know, I mean, I'm going to bring up the old, the old song, the more you eat, the more you too. Mm -hmm. And it's actually the more you eat, the less you toot because your gut microbiome does get more of that bacteria that breaks down those sugars that are in the beans. It's actually the sugars that if you don't have a lot of that um, bacteria in your gut, then when you eat them only every once in a while, there's just not enough of the bacteria in there to break down those sugars. And so those sugars ferment and cause gas and uncomfortableness. So if you eat them more often, more of those um, good bacteria that break down the sugars will, will generate in your yeah. gut and they will have an easier time to break down the sugars in, la in beans and they won't ferment. They'll just keep on going straight on through. And again, whatever, whatever kind of beans that you want. I mean, a can of beans here. I have a Lano can of beans, uh, Cannonelli beans, I, uh, Cannellini beans. I also have a bag of Great Northern. And if the, oh, the hardest thing about beans 
if you want to buy the super cheap kind, which is basically the, the, the bag of beans from the grocery store, the hardest part is remembering to soak them overnight. That's the hardest part. If you remember to soak them overnight, then just drain the water. And that's an all important part also about um, decreasing the amount of, um, of gas that, that comes from when you're cooking beans and eating beans is to soak them overnight because some of the sugars are getting into that soaking water, then dump that water, then fill them with fresh beet, fresh water to soak, to cook them, then dump that water before you, at the cooking water before you eat the beans and then stir them into some other sauce or add olive oil and some herbs and some garlic. Or even, I'm not, I mean, even stir in some barbecue sauce and make barbecue beans. I mean, that is, as long as you're eating those beans, I don't care if it has a little bit of sugar in it. That's yeah. barbecued beans are still part of the Mediterranean diet. Just don't go overboard with all the, all the other barbecue sauce and everything that you add, you add to it. Nice, nice, nice. I did. Um, can we move to a question regarding breakfast and what does a Mediterranean breakfast look like? And we were just talking because it is earlier in the day and we didn't get a chance to eat breakfast. And there is, um, there is definitely a conversation about, uh, timed, uh, restricted time eating and the importance of after that restricted time, or even if you're not, if you're not subscribing to that particular diet, uh, to make sure that your glycemic index of the food that you eat is not very high to you. So you're not uh, stressing stressing your system by dumping a lot of glucose. And then there's a conversation about insulin sensitivity, not even for those that are diabetic, but even preventing preventing disease. So what does a Mediterranean breakfast look like? All right. So I have the latest book here. This is a sustainable Mediterranean diet cookbook. I'm just going to well, read as, you some of the... As, 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 as we... Right? Okay. <laughs> Great. Have you eaten any, have you tried any of the recipes, guys? We have read them. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <That's, laughs> does that help? <laughs> okay. So um, I'm just going to read down the list. We have creamy cantaloupe orange smoothies. That's basically frozen. Um, during the, this, is, this is probably a summertime recipe unless you go to the grocery store in the winter and get your cantaloupe and you just put it into the freezer and just freeze it for a couple minutes so that's really icy and then you add greek yogurt and a tiny touch of honey and um, a whole orange or a whole mandarin because it's got the fiber it's got those extra because most of the vitamin c is located right below the peel of an orange so if you use the whole orange number one you're not generating food waste because that's the system this is the sustainable mediterranean diet cookbook and you're getting all of that vitamin C and all of the fiber in the, um, in the mandarin. And a lot of people don't realize that you can actually eat the whole orange. That's why there's different candies that use the peel of the orange. So, right. Okay. So, I mean, the peel, I, I was so surprised when I read that, that, that you yeah. could put the peel in. It was such a bad. great idea. <clears throat> and then we've got mushroom and scrambled egg breakfast bruschetta, which is again, more um, mushrooms. That's one of the one of the most sustainable vegetables out there. Mushrooms can grow anywhere with a low amount of soil, low amount of water, lots of vitamin D. Everybody needs more vitamin D in the winter time. So eat more mushrooms. They're a great vegetable for any meal. Um, then we have good morning polenta with ricotta and apples. Ricotta is high in protein. You can find some whole grain polentas. It's basically just cornmeal that is a whole grain cornmeal mixed with ricotta cheese. Overnight fig, fig and orange overnight oats. Those figs, lots of fiber, lots of protein in the overnight oats because there's also milk in there. And then so on down the, down the line. I, what, what I would say about a Mediterranean diet is a lot of time it's either fruit or it's going to be more of a savory kind. So there isn't usually a lot of sugar in a Mediterranean breakfast. Um, and that is true that when you first eat in the morning, it is a good idea to really pump up the protein, the fiber, and not a lot of sugar in the morning. That's a good idea. But not everybody likes to do that. So we have a touch of sweetness in some of the, the recipes that we um, hear. Because again, if you're just 
just new to the Mediterranean diet and maybe you've always eaten a breakfast with a lot with more sugar in it, it's good to sort of transition in there. And so we have some good ideas on how to do that. And that a lot of times it is the dry food. I try to say, try to get with 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 your breakfast, try to get at least three food groups. So a protein, a whole grain, because whole grains is really easy in the morning. Some people might not think of whole grains with lunch or dinner, but for breakfast, a lot of people do. And then a fruit or a vegetable. So even if it's dried fruit, maybe it's mushrooms, maybe it's um, uh, sun-dried tomatoes, or I'm probably not going to eat fresh tomatoes in the in the winter time. But I might put a little bit of um, canned diced tomatoes on my ricotta toast with um, canned tomatoes. I might do that. How do you feel about canned fruit versus frozen fruit and Ooh, the relative benefits? I love benefits? that question. That's a great question. Yes, I got it. lots. We <laughs> love canned fruit. We love frozen fruit. We love dried fruit. Um, so again, not only is it zero waste. People don't think about that. Canned fruit, frozen fruit, and dried fruit are all zero waste. The great thing about that, um, all of those is the manufacturers have figured out what to do that with that waste for you. So all those trimmings from even the grape stems before they made raisins or all of the, um, uh, the broccoli stems before they made the frost, frozen broccoli. Um, even the corn cobs before they put the frozen corn in the package, they figured out how to do it. And believe me, they have, because I've been to, been to many of these, um, these manufacturing plants where they just take the frozen, well, let's take frozen uh, raspberries, for example. I've been to the place where they shake down the, the bushes and they fall off of the bushes of the raspberries and they go down a little conveyor belt and they go into a bin and then literally in 24 hours, they were from the field to the, um, to the bag of frozen raspberries. I mean, yeah. that is so quick. There is no raspberry grower in the nation that can get raspberries to your market in 24 hours. So they flash freeze all of the nutrients and all the antioxidants in those frozen raspberries, and they are in that package, and then they're in your smoothie or on your oatmeal or in your muffins, whatever you decide to do with them. And that's what's, it's the same with every fruit and vegetable that's frozen. And canned, it's very similar. Do I worry about the sugar in canned fruits and vegetables? Not so much, because again, if you get them that are in, 100% juice. You should look for 100% juice. Don't get the don't get the um, syrup, but get the 100% juice. And you can always find ways to incorporate that juice into smoothies or make your oatmeal with pineapple juice. Make your um, make your uh, whole grain. Make your whole grain uh, uh, quinoa or bar barley for dinner as a side. Make your whole brown rice in pineapple juice. Mm. Yum. So it then adds some dried fruit to that, and that would be perfect alongside of your whatever you're serving, um, whether it's um, a nice fillet of fish, whether it's a chicken drumstick, whether it's a, um, a whatever it what is. What kind of protein? Right, right. Is whatever is there protein is that would be delicious? So I don't worry about all those. Those again, they're zero waste and they're easy to grab, and they. Not only have they figured out what to do with them before they put them in the can, but then you don't have the waste on your end either. Yeah. And it's not, I mean, there's there's a case to be made that frozen fruit saves more of the nutrients than the fresh fruit that you see because it was fresh, flash frozen so quickly, right? We, we had talked to someone before that that, that that was a big plus for them with that. You know, what I was wondering is as a, as a smoothie um, fan myself, <laughs> are there ways that we should think about making smoothies or different different you know styles of macerating it or to 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 keep the nutrients inside to to not lose the nutritional value. You know, I I, I always worry that we're drinking glorified uh, sugar water by the time that we're drinking a smoothie. Yeah, just use whole fruits. Use the um, use the frozen fruits so that it adds to the body of the smoothie and makes it a really nice, I mean, frozen bananas are great. They had such nice bodies. So does frozen blueberries, frozen cantaloupe, 
uh, frozen pineapple, frozen strawberries. No, don't worry about that. Just throw whatever you have in the blender. And it's a great way to prevent food waste too, because any of the like sad oranges or even grapes, sad grapes at the bottom of the refrigerator, throw those into your smoothie. Then you won't be tossing them and wasting them and you'll still get some of the nutrition. You know, maybe by the time that they're, they've come sad grapes, you know, they've lost some of the um, vitamin C in them, but they haven't lost the fiber. So just throw those in and that counts, counts as sweetness, but no, just throw them all into the blender. It's, and it, it keeps the, the nutrition. I would add definitely when I'm, again, I would think about at least two or three food groups in the blender though. I would try to add um, some sort of protein. So whether it's dairy, Greek yogurt, it's one of my favorite because it leads to such a nice texture in the smoothie. I would try to add some sort of seed or not. So whether it's peanut butter or whether it's um, any of the seeds. I mean, it can even be sunflower seeds, but chia seeds, flax seeds. So you've got your protein, you've got your seed, and then you've got your fruit, some sort of fruit. I like it. Um, I lost my thought. Yeah, lunch. I like that. Lunch. How about, okay, can we, let, let's, let's pivot over to lunches. Um, lunches are tricky sometimes because for a lot of us, it's about preparing. Well, you have five kids, so I, I have three, but you know, it's, it's about preparing lunches for school the next day and for work. Um, how do you handle the topic of lunches? A lot of times I do what's left over from dinner. So if there's leftovers from dinner, that's a great thing to have for lunches. Um, a lot of times, but they don't like a lot of like little packages. Like they just want to, I make them make them their lunch, their own lunch in the morning, because if they don't make it, they don't have any say in it and they won't eat it. If, but if they mm. invested some time and energy into their lunches, then now it's a lot more likely that they will eat it. Um, also back to the Mediterranean diet, if there's any way that you can advocate for students having more time to eat their lunch, that's also a really helpful yeah. thing because if they don't have the time, they certainly don't have the time to take a right. breath let alone even eat all of their lunch. So I always encourage if there's any way that, that moms can, can advocate um, or dads for more lunch time. That's very, very helpful and very Mediterranean. Yeah. But when we get down to what's for lunch, I mean, it all comes down to, you know, what are they going to put in their lunch box? Sandwiches are fine. Um, that uh, a lot of times we have more of a vegetarian dinner. So a lot of times my kids take meat sandwiches for, for lunch, um, but they also take peanut butter and jelly. They they eat a lot of um, frozen vegetables, so they'll throw the frozen vegetables in a container, and by then, by lunchtime, they'll thaw. So frozen broccoli, frozen corn, um, of course, carrot sticks, totally fine. But one of the easiest things to do is beans. They almost mm -hmm. every day take some sort of bean for lunch also. So that's usually, they get really sick of carrot sticks, but they don't usually get sick of beans because there's so many different kinds. So you've got your plain cannellini beans, but you've also got Mexican style um, chili beans. You've got um, all kinds of different flavors of beans. And then I will cook a big batch and then they can add different flavorings to them, but usually that's too rushed in the morning. So usually they'll just grab a can of beans and throw them in their lunchbox. A lot of times that's what they, well, what if your kids don't eat beans? Well, mix them with pasta, mix them with rice, mix them with anything that um, can be either quickly warmed in the microwave, which a lot of times high school kids can do, or you can make some sort of cold bean and um, pasta salad. That's mm. another really easy thing that um, they'll do a lot of times. For adults, I'm telling you, I think tuna packets have changed my life. I mean, literally, yeah. tuna packets are the best. Um, also, thinking um, in terms of whole grains, that's a great time to grab a whole grain because it will keep you full. And thinking about all the different ways. Let's see, what's that whole grain salad in our book? A lot of times I like to s switch up the sweet and the savory. So adding raisins and olives or raisins and um, canned um, canned uh, tomatoes. Um, doing a big um, pan of vegetables. Um, this is the toasted 
cauliflower tabbouleh, which is um, basically you cake frozen cauliflower, so frozen riced cauliflower, and mix in all the ingredients for tabbouleh. But there's not very many of them. It's only this is only a one, two, three, four, five, six ingredient recipe. It's just toasted riced cauliflower, or you can just use regular cauliflower, and then olive oil, lemon, garlic, black pepper, canned tomatoes, fresh parsley, and if you want to throw in some fresh mint, you can too. But again, that is a giant bunch of vegetables. Add some cracked whole grain crackers on the side and maybe some canned beans or some canned um, uh, uh, tuna and you've got a meal. Can I bring you back for a second to the, um, the, I, the if you send your kids with a, a meat sandwich or sandwich with meat in it, what kind of meat do you, are you talking about um, sort of processed meat or something else? What are you talking about there? Absolutely. I have no problem with, with I guess you could call it processed meat. It's well, deli meat. It's deli meat. meat, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, I mean, again, they really need some sort of um, high protein food to get through the whole rest of the day. Because most of sure. my kids go from lunch to practice yeah. and then home. And so they are eating from noon to um, dinner time. And I would love if they would get a pre-workout snack before their um, basketball or track practice, but a lot of times they don't. So they really need something that's pretty high protein at lunchtime. And yeah. yes, you can do it with just beans, but I really think that they've got to get some sort of um, meat in there to really make it last the whole time. They probably don't eat it. They probably eat it three to four <laughs> out of um, five for for lunchtime, but right. I, I pretty much advocate for some sort of um, meat, meat. Or, or fish at lunchtime so that they can make it all the way. You know, there was something you said, oh, this is a funny thing to fixate on, but you mentioned peanut butter and jelly. And in our school, the, the kids, the schools that our kids go to, they won't let you send in peanut well, butter. Down, which yeah. is I thought it was universal. And I, you know, as a someone who grew up on peanut butter and jelly, <laughs> it was, but I mean, I, I understand it. It's just, it's a, uh, it's interesting that some places you can bring them in, some places you, you can't. You can still bring in an kids. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Some of them have different tables, but our our school just there is. I don't even know. I'm yeah, 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 I'm just yeah. like yeah. yes. No, I just it just better. it just struck me just kind of like oh yeah, people can still do that somewhere. That's <laughs> no, nice. People can, no. yes, which is great. You mentioned uh, you brought up the idea of snacks, and that's definitely something we wanted to ask you about. What what is your feeling on snacks, and how do you approach it from the from that standpoint of Mediterranean? Again, lots of nuts, because most people don't get enough nuts. Most mm -hmm. people, uh, nuts and seeds. And we don't want to, I, I always say, if you're sick of nuts, don't forget about seeds. Sunflower seeds are fabulous. And a lot of people don't think about, them. they're also one of the cheaper nuts out there too. Um, also peanuts. Peanuts are actually a legume. So they do count sort of as a bean, but they're also, they sort of count as a vegetable or a protein. Um, but peanuts are one of the um, less expensive nuts out there too. So it doesn't have to be almonds or walnuts, although those are wonderful as well. And walnuts are one of the highest in omega-3s. So for brain health and heart health, those are fabulous. But most people, again, just don't get enough of those foods in there. So I almost always recommend nuts for a snack. And then you'll try to get one more one more food group in there. So usually dried fruit or fresh fruit, um, could be cheese, could be... Um, we go through tons and tons of raisins. So because I have this out here, um, because they're one of the less expensive um, dried fruit. They're also amazing for gut health. Raisins are one of the best besides prunes for gut health um, because they have a type of fiber and a type of fermentable sugar in there that helps increase the good bacteria in your gut. So I love raisins. Um, but I would say a nut and a fruit or um, cheese or yogurt are probably the best. Also the seeds. Seeds are actually even more sustainable than nuts. And so not forgetting about adding chia seed or flax seed to a bowl of yogurt or adding sesame seeds, sorry, sunflower seeds, or 
like I said, sesame seed. Um, if people haven't tried tahini and they're sick of peanut butter, I don't know if your kids can have tahini. Um, it is um, it is one of the now considered one of the top allergens sesame seed is. But tahini is made from sesame seeds. And there is a company out of Pennsylvania called Zoom who makes the most amazing tahini. And they have a chocolate tahini. So you may be able to have chocolate tahini and jelly sandwiches or just chocolate tahini sandwiches or just regular tahini. And tahini is can be used any place that peanut butter can. I like to swirl it into a lot of whole grains like brown rice or um, farro or... Um, Quinoa, barley, all those. It has a nice, really nutty flavor. Definitely going to check that out. It's, the, the company's called Soom? Soom? S-O-O-M. Oh, okay. Soom. Soom. Like Soom, but no, Soom. Okay, yes. got it. <laughs> um, can we jump to desserts? We have to. We have to. We have everyone, <laughs> everyone wants to know. Stop it. How do we, how do we get, how do we... How do we both get to eat yummy desserts and not feel guilty about it? Okay. So again, thinking about how it can be some, maybe if you've missed some of these things in your, if you, okay. So as a dietitian, I would think through what did I miss throughout the day? Did I miss some fruits, some of my fruits and vegetable servings? Did I miss some of my nuts? That's what I would do, but not everybody does that. So we have lots of options in the book that are mostly fruits and nuts and whole grains and lots of spices. So a lot of people don't think about spices for dessert, but that is a great way. Cinnamon is great for the brain. Um, crushed red pepper, not necessarily for dessert, but smoked paprika. We actually have a cookie. It's an oatmeal cookie that has a little touch of smoked paprika in it. Because it's just kind of, it, and peanut butter. So it's peanut butter, smoked paprika, and um, oatmeal that are in this um, cookie. And it's just kind of a little undertone that makes you like, oh, what is this? Oh, it's kind of bit, a little bit more satisfying. Yeah. Um, dark chocolate also can be part of the Mediterranean diet. Mm -hmm. And we do have a salted dark chocolate orange mug cake, which is just a few ingredients that you pop into the microwave. And it's one of those mug cakes, but this one actually works. Some of those other ones, they end up being like hard as a hockey puck. No, this one actually works. It's just olive oil, an orange, some lemon, uh, sorry, not lemon, honey and flour and cocoa. And then it's done in 30 seconds. But how in general do I think about dessert? In, in terms of the Mediterranean diet, it is usually fruit. I mean, that is very typical. The baked goods and the special treats are usually for religious holidays or different um, special occasions, birthdays um, throughout the year. So really trying to think about fruit forward dessert is a really good idea. How do you make fruit forward dessert? You would be surprised at how delicious it is when you take an apple, hollow, hollow out the core, put a little bit of raisins and nuts and honey in the middle and bake it or even just microwave it. So good. My kids, whenever we do make um, whipped cream, we always do almost half and half with heavy cream and Greek yogurt because not only does the Greek yogurt increase the nutrients, but it also helps the yogurt or helps the whipped cream stay longer. So you could make it one day and use part of it the next day too. It actually would work in the refrigerator. So fruits, Greek yogurt. We have a really yummy recipe for dessert. Um, this Greek yogurt recipe is a yogurt bark, which just means that you um, put Greek yogurt on a um, baking tray and add all different kinds of even just cereal, um, whole grain cracker crumbs, uh, fruit, and then you freeze it and then you break it into bark. Um, and it's just kind of fun. Oh, so good. Yes. But again, I thinking like... about fruit for right. the Mediterranean diet is, it's, it's the most Mediterranean way to go. I was hoping you were going to ask the question of, can we have dessert for breakfast? 
but it certainly sounds like some of these can it's be like like breakfast it. bars or yeah, almost. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The bark sounds like that would be terrific. Right up. Right. Yeah. 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 Wow. You like fun. You have um, a bunch of amazing kitchen hacks in the book, and I've heard you talk about it elsewhere. Could you give us some of your, your favorite? Yeah. I'll just go down the list because okay. I think it's one that um, these are probably some of our most popular. And so we do Facebook Live every Thursday at 1130 Eastern, and we do a free cooking demonstration of one of our recipes, but always having lots of hacks. And so we have, oh my gosh, probably six, five years of, Facebook Lives that you can go back and basically learn to cook Mediterranean from these Facebook Lives. And some of the most popular hacks that we have that we say over and over again, and people are like, oh, I never thought about that, is, and this is one of our favorite, and as docs, you definitely would love this one because it helps decrease the amount of salt that you use in your cooking, and that is to add acid. So, Whenever you get done and you taste your dish, like it did a soup or a stew or even a sandwich, and you're like, this needs more salt, stop. Don't use the salt shaker, add a little bit of acid. So that can be everything from just a little sprinkle of, and this is going to surprise you, but rice vinegar. And I like rice vinegar because it's a little bit more mellow than um, like white vinegar or apple cider vinegar because it's a little tiny bit sweeter and it's not quite as, like I said, um, sharp as as um, white vinegar or lemon juice. And again, I said that I would talk about this lemon, but adding a little squirt of, um, and, and it can be as little as, um, if it's for your, if it's just one serving, as little as like a half a teaspoon, or if it's a big stew pot, even just a tablespoon of vinegar, will just make your your taste buds salivate a little bit. It'll just kind of wake them up. It's just like a little bit of sparkle to the dish. So adding more acid before you reach for the salt shaker is probably my number one um, tip. And it's also very Mediterranean because um, so much of the food is so well balanced in the Mediterranean, meaning that you get that fat, that acid, that salt, and that savoring us from every single dish. Number two is using fresh herbs. And I talked about that a little bit. So using, so think about this, use cupfuls of herbs instead of tablespoons of herbs. So most recipes will say, throw in a tablespoon of cilantro or parsley at the end, or throw in even a, you know, a couple tablespoons. Anytime that you can use a tablespoon of an herb, you can absolutely use a cup full of herbs <laughs> because if the flavor profile is going to work, you're just adding more green, it's more Mediterranean, and it adds fiber and antioxidants. And especially in the wintertime when there's not enough, a lot of other fresh vegetables, um, it also is more sustainable to use cupfuls of herbs because then they don't end up moldy and brown in the bottom of your refrigerator. And they're so budget friendly. You know, a little bunch of cilantro is like a dollar in the grocery store. So bringing it home, chopping it up and throwing it into everything. And what a lot of people don't realize is the stems of the cilantro are actually sweeter than the leaves. So don't toss the stems of the cilantro or a lot of herbs um, because they add extra fiber protein, extra fiber and um, antioxidants. I'm that's good. another fun one. Wow. I love cilantro, so that's great to hear. Yes. We, um, I already talked about using more frozen um, fruit and vegetables. Absolutely think of that as part of your, you know, uh, two to three servings of fruit. It's fruits and vegetables a day um, in, ter in terms of, um, I mean, overall five, but I always think of like two servings of fruits and three servings of vegetables a day. Try to think of that. Um, so, don't forget about frozen and, and canned fruits and vegetables for those serving. Um, and we also touched a little bit about using meat for a flavoring. Don't forget about the fact that meat has just so much flavor. So even if you add, you know, one or two chicken breasts to a whole pot of stew, that's still adding flavor, adding protein, and 
but yet not serving a giant chicken breast to every single person at the table. It also helps you eat more vegetables. So thinking about meat as a way to eat more vegetables is a really great way to sort of structure your plate because it's it's flavor and that's very Mediterranean. A lot of, you know, every culture that you can think of has a pot of beans that's flavored by some meat. Yeah. Um, and then I, we also talked about mushrooms before mushrooms are one of my favorite vegetables. Cause again, they're sustainable vitamin D for the, um, summer chat for the winter time when we all need more vitamin D and they can be an extender. So while we talked about meat adding flavor, we can add, talk about different extenders for meat. So when you have a pound of ground meat, so whether it's ground beef or any other ground, um, meat, Always, always add an extender to it. So that can be chopped mushrooms. That can be um, uh, farro. It can be quinoa. It can be bulgur, especially whole wheat bulgur, because it's a very small grain. It's actually wheat, but it's a smaller um, chopped up kind of wheat that's toasted. And then it's very easy to just rehydrate and add it to that ground meat. And it extends the meat, so it makes you feel like you're eating more. And you're also adding a whole grain or a vegetable. So that's one of our favorite ways. We have this um, whole grain um, hummus with meat on top. And in the meat itself, you add um, mushrooms. Isn't this beautiful? This is a very Mediterranean. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's hummus on the bottom and then ground meat with mushrooms extended in it and parsley and tomatoes on top. And you could use canned tomatoes in the wintertime. So, and then you just eat that in flatbread. Very Mediterranean way to eat ground meat. Um, and then the lat, uh, we already talked about cooking pasta right. Don't forget to cook it just till I don't, al dente. And then it keeps you fuller longer and is a more satisfying um, bowl of pasta because it isn't so waterlogged and it takes longer for your body to digest. And then lastly is cooking whole grains in flavor. So you know how I talked about saving that canned peaches juice or canned pineapple juice and cooking your whole grains in it. Um, again, the way of eating Mediterranean, especially in some of the North African countries and in the Middle Eastern countries, is to really combine the sweet and the savory flavor. So a lot of times they'll have a soup or a stew that is has dried fruit in it, or canned fruit in it, or just the flavors of the canned fruit, or the or the sweet um, spices like cinnamon, and um, those that combining of sweet and savory flavors is very Mediterranean. It kind of wakes up your palate. It's just such a fun, yummy way to eat. It's great. It's great hacks. Yes. <laughs> there was one thing that I, I, I guess is not a it's not a hack per se, but I, I forget if it was in your book or if I heard you talk about it. Um, it just caught my, my ear as someone who likes cappuccinos. Uh, you had mentioned that skim milk actually makes better foam than whole milk. Is that right? Yes. There was, somebody did the research. I've done it too. And I try it out and it does. The skim milk somehow, because um, the proteins are able to whip up more in there there's less fat to sort of get in the way of those protein um, molecules to hold together. The skim milk does make better foam. So if you have one of those little frothers, try it out yeah. and do like a little test and see um, which foam lasts longer and which foam goes bigger. That's great. So I, I, I tried to make a cappuccino with eggnog one time. It was not a, it was not a success. <laughs> Yeah, because of all the sugar and all the fat in there that's going to yeah. displace some of the protein and just get in the way of the patri the protein matrix in making it. So it sounds good. Doesn't it, sounds it sound delicious. nice? Yes, but... I, it sounded good to me too. <laughs> it's worth it. It's worth the chart. Wow. Yes, that's sure. from way back. Thank you for listening. That is not in today and it's not in my books. That's that's on our, um, that's one of the hacks in our healthy kitchen hacks in our, um, on our Facebook page and on our website, teaspoonofspice.com. Yeah, well, the cool thing Can about- I say it now, it's because I have a business partner, Deanna, who I've written all these books with, 
she would have joined us today, but she was feeling a little under the weather. So she sure the best. Yeah. Yeah. She'll speedy be recovery. Up in the men too. Back on Facebook Live either this Thursday or next Thursday. Well, and as you said, the, the cool thing about the Facebook Live, that the, the history of that is that these things don't go out of style, really, right? You, you know, the, the hacks that were good five years ago are good today. They absolutely are. I, I appreciate you say that because, yeah. Our first cookbook came out in 2018, and honestly, it is still selling like hotcakes Yeah, all the time. I mean, that's it's like it's seven years old. It is absolutely not going out of style. I just saw the sales numbers for over the holiday season, and um, the first one and the second one, and now the third one, and then the fourth one are all <laughs> just the other one. They're selling really well, and they don't go out of sale because what happens, and I hear this all the time, I'll go to the bookstore I don't just kind of, you know, hover and hang out. <laughs> and almost every time I hear this conversation, well, the doctor told us to go on the Mediterranean diet and we just need a good cookbook. And so, <laughs> and they're looking through the cookbooks and I just kind of swoop in and say, well, this is a good one. And <laughs> mine. And yes. it, it happens all the time. So, not only does it not go out of style, but healthcare professionals are still recommending it. I mean, it's still the number one best diet in 2024 as recommended by U.S. News and World Reports. It was still number yeah. one diet. They look at diets every single year. They say which is easiest to follow, which has the best health outcomes in terms of all chronic disease and especially now mental health. People are looking at that more. Um, and number one, 2024 it's still, I think it's been number one for the last nine years, U.S. world. Yeah, as the most, most recommended, course, most, most advised. Which is really refreshing because a lot of times as nutritionists, we get the bad rap that, oh, you guys are always changing your minds. Right. <laughs> right. No, it's not, we're not still talking about the Mediterranean well, diet. And it is true. I mean, science says is emerging all the time, yeah. which is fun to talk about, but. Well, and, and the really, the really cool thing that you you mentioned, it, it made me think of my 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 in laws are from the former Yugoslavia, from Serbia, and that diet, um, I never really thought of as a Mediterranean diet, but actually, you know, when I compare it to what I perceived, you know, more French, Italian, something like that, there's a lot of overlap, and a lot of times you're eating it, and and, and so it kind of goes to there's endless variations that you can put on this because there's so many different cultures. Or what's one of your favorite? Oh, you're gonna get me anything my mother in law makes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I love the um, it's the most recommended answer. I love the chivaccia is a is a combination of different meats. It's uh, lamb and 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 beef and uh, you know lots of spices and I love that. There's 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 really there's so much um, phyllo leaves and that that go into things and the pizza that she makes. So you know, to be honest, there's you know a lot of the foods I don't know the names to, but I like eating them. <laughs> so if you put it in front of me, I could point to it, but, um, but there's so much, there's so much there and there's so much overlap. You know, we do a lot of traveling around the Mediterranean and, and I never really thought about how there's, you know, there's a certain core that, that kind of permeates these different cultures. Um, and I, you know, even when I was in, I, I, remember, I remember being in Israel and, you know, there's just, whether you're in the Middle East or, or Eastern Europe or. Western Europe, there's a lot that, that there's a lot of through line through all of that. That's uh, I hadn't really thought of, but it but it speaks to how the Mediterranean diet can constantly, you know, you can never really get bored of it if you keep on exploring it because there's so many variations you can put into it. The seeds with something that, you know, I hadn't, you know, I, I think we underutilize a lot. And I I love chia seeds, flax seeds, and there's so many others that we could be playing with. For sure, for sure. Yeah, you can really switch things up. And again, yeah, you just have a core of whatever's in season, plus some beans, plus some Greek yogurt and eggs and fermented foods like, like I said, Greek yogurt. And then there's also different ferments all around the Mediterranean too, which we won't go into because some of them are a little more um, trickier to find, but just any sort of fermented food and then switching up the spices. And you're right, you can eat for forever. And and not be bored because you have all these different terms, all these different spices and herbs and the way they're combined and some of dried fruits or different fresh fruits and never be. Yeah. And all the more reason for more cookbooks into the future. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, look for our, um, I even have the cover. Where's the cover? Yeah, show sure. it. It's uh, about we brain health. the cover of the Smart Mediterranean Diet. So all the rest of the books, 
have been kind of in the blue scheme. And then this one's um, this one's really fun. This one is our favorite in terms of pictures. Oh my yeah. goodness. Photographer. We'll have it up on the screen. You, you, you can we'll, see every we'll day. Have the just Presumably. gorgeous. But the last one that we have the cover of the Smart Mediterranean Dive Cookbook. And nice. it's bright yellow, kind of the connection with the brain and the light bulb. And oh, <laughs> this one is so fun. It's got so many yummy recipes all for your brain in it. And um, just the mental health. I'm going to talk about one study that's my favorite. In terms, We talked a little bit about olive oil. But and, uh, and uh, since you're talking about Israel, too, one of my favorite studies that um, I found when we were researching for this book is about how um, people, it was a study done in Israel. There's a lot of nutrition research that comes out of Israel. Really well done, um, double-blinded, placebo-controlled study found that people who were severely depressed who ate a tablespoon and a half of all, extra virgin olive oil for, it was about six weeks, had a decrease in their um, symptoms for depression. That's it. A wow. tablespoon and a half of olive oil every single day for about six weeks, and they could see the results. So while a lot of nutrition, you know, it's certainly not the same as pharmaceuticals where you take a pill and you feel better in a couple of days, nutrition takes longer. Most of the time we tell people, give it a couple months. I mean, usually like three months before you're going to see a big difference in terms of how you feel. I mean, there may be some, um, there may be some benefits in um, you know, other benefits, yeah, like, like, like health, the biomarkers and, and yeah, uh, more energy and that sort of thing. But in terms of brain health, you really it's probably going to take a good three months. But to be to be fair, uh, if you look at pharmaceuticals, uh, the antidepressants really don't take a couple sure. of days. We're yeah, talking sure. about uh, four, four well, to six weeks, so it's not if, far not, off. if not longer. That yeah, is true. yeah. And yeah. that's another point. Well, um, if you talk to probably some of your um, uh, your brain uh, doc colleagues. Well, antidepressants, it takes a while to find the right one to fit your brain and to make your brain chemicals work. They're very individual. Seafood and omega-3s from seafood can help everyone. And yeah. so you're mm. seeing a lot more um, brain health docs recommending seafood, especially those, those high um, omega-3 cold water. When people say cold water fishes, you're like, what is that? It just means that they have a lot of fat in them. So fishes with a lot of fat. So it's sardines, it's mackerel, it's tuna, and that helps everybody across the board. You don't have to wait for the right one to yeah. work. Like, By the way, there was, there was something, you, I think it was you that said uh, in some interview, I, I can't remember exactly, but uh, the topic of salmon came up. And I always thought of salmon as a, you know, part of the Mediterranean diet. And you pointed out, um, I think it, it might've been Deanna, um, saying, you know, there's no salmon in the Mediterranean. <laughs> I thought it was such a, it was such a cute, you know, such a, oh, of course, right? But, but, um, but of course, you know, it fits within the diet, I think. But, it does. but, and there's the other ones, yeah, the sardines and the mackerel and the other, the, there's so many of our local fishes that we wouldn't yeah. even know what they are. So, yeah. it's true. That is 100% true. Um, but I, they, I never, so much more tied to their everyday life because they live all in Mediterranean. Right. And just a just a quick question: the uh, the olive oil study that you mentioned right. was that them taking it just straight, or or they were cooking with the olive they, oil? They had to eat it throughout the day. Throughout so the day, so it wasn't have, like they, they took a tablespoon in there. No, it absolutely could be used in in, um, in their in the cooking. cooking. Yeah. And just to clarify, was there a specific olive oil that they used? Extra virgin, cold pressed. It was extra virgin. Yes. Extra virgin. Okay. Yep. That okay. is a very yeah. We we really I, I sort of gloss over that fact, but yeah, we always recommend extra virgin olive oil just because it's higher in nutrients. Mm -hmm. As I said, I mean, in terms of antioxidants, as yeah. I said before, sometimes when you cook, if you cook at a higher temperature, some of those antioxidants are lost, but you still have the benefit of um, the omega threes, and it's just a p kind of a less processed oil. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, terrific. I think I'm getting hungry. Yeah. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. Thank you so much. You've been, you've been really generous with your time. Thank you so much. Oh, this you're very welcome. You're this very, very, welcome. Informative. very informative. Yeah. yeah. Just check out our teaspoonofspice.com website for lots of other Mediterranean recipes and join us on Facebook on 
Thursdays at 1130 Eastern, we have a free cooking demo almost every Thursday. It's either myself or Deanna. Perfect. And we'll put the links for all of that. Great. Absolutely. Thank Absolutely. You. Okay. Now this is the recipe. Let's see. You have to go home and make. So this is one of my favorites. This is the skillet cacio pepe with pepper. And it teaches you specifically how to make pasta the right way so that it, um, and it's just, it's just frozen peas, salt, pepper, lingu a package of linguine, olive oil, and a little bit of Parmesan cheese. So that's one, two, three, four, five ingredients. Nice. Perfect Mediterranean, perfect for a cold day. Go make it. <laughs> nice. We're still getting you. We'll do it together. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Friends, thank you for your attention. We hope you've enjoyed the conversation. If you find value, please remember to hit the like button, help us with our YouTube algorithm. Consider subscribing to the channel and turn on the notifications so you can stay up to date with everything going on with the channel. And please leave us a comment. Let us know what you thought about the show and also what you'd like to hear about in the future.